Thank you, Rector Visakorpi, ladies and gentlemen. Statisticians, and more generally all of those who apply statistical methods, need statistics. That means data as the raw material. In a way, statistical methods are ships sailing in the data. Both are extremely important for each other. The opening address of the conference will be given by Dr. Timo Teresvirta from the Research Institute of the Finnish Economy. Among other things, uh, Dr. Teresvirta is the chairman of the program committee of, of the European Meeting of Econometric Society. This meeting will be held in August in Copenhagen. It's my privilege to give the floor to Dr. Teresvirta. He will tell us how we got the data. Dr. Teresvirta, the floor is yours. What you see up there on the screen may uh, seem familiar to a few of you. Actually, I've left a little hint down there to indicate that. And indeed, those are the first words of the uh, opening address of uh, the first Tampere seminar in 1983. And uh, starting from those words, Professor Gustav Elving went on to present some of the early uh, represent, representatives of Finnish mathematical statistics and their statistical contributions. If Professor Elving deemed those words good enough for the beginning of his opening address here in Tampere, I see no reason why they should not be successfully, could not be successfully recycled and used, uh, used uh, again for the same, same purpose today. However, I do not intend to tell you anything about the past, present or future of the Finnish math mathematical statistics. Indeed, instead, I shall relate how the Finnish and uh, Swedish statisticians got what keeps uh, still quite a few of them busy today, and may even a little bit scare the rest, the data. Uh, the story is about how collecting population data on a regular basis started in Sweden, Finland. As you can see from there, we were the first in the world to do that, so there's some tradition in some areas at least. Uh, it will, this, this will be basically a story of two memoranda. One memoranda was written by a scientist and the other one was written by a combination of an officer and a gentleman. I'll explain to you later. Uh, to give you some background to the story, I shall tell you something about uh, what happened before 1749. Collecting demogra demographic data in Finland had started already in the 17th century. Many parishes made lists on baptism and, and marriages. And there was a new ecclesiastic law in 1686, which obliged priests in every parish to collect, um, to record the members, the births, deaths, marriages, and people entering and leaving the congregation. This produced a wealth of data, but the government did not try to make any systematic use of this information. A suggestion in 1729 to arrange a general census in the country did not receive any positive response in the parliament. The attitude of the government, however, started changing a few years later. Uh, responding to a request of the parliament, King Adolf Friedrich in 1735 uh, decreed that the governors of the provinces should, for each parliamentary session, uh, write a report on the state of the province. And uh, this report also had to contain information on changes in the number of inhabitants in the area. Some governors, gov governors did provide this information, some gov governors did not, and obviously there were as many ways of presenting this information as there were reporting governors. 
as we, we shall see, this impractical and annoying diversity was in fact an important reason for one of the two memoranda I'm going to talk about. The next more important step in developing population statistics uh, in Sweden, Finland, was the establishment uh, of the so-called Sanitary Commission uh, that happened in uh, 1737. The task of the commission was to keep watch on unusual illnesses and epidemics so that uh, precautions against them could be taken as quickly as possible. The first measure of the commission then was to propose a system for collecting statistics on mortality and illnesses. This proposal was successful in that the king obliged the dioceses to collect such data from their parishes and send them to the governors. But in practice, the data were re reported in a very arbitrary way. The material obtained was incomplete and partially incorrect, and thus not very useful to the decision makers of the day. Although this effort of compiling statistics on mortality and illnesses did not yet have great practi practical significance, it must have attracted, attracted keen attention in the Royal Academy of Science, which was established in 1739. It seems that the members of the new academy were quick in grasping the importance of reliable population statistics to the country. The secretary of the academy since uh, 1744, Bar Elvius, he was an astronomer, astronomer, was the most active member in these matters. In 1744, he published a scientific paper in demography, the first one in its kind in Sweden, Finland. In, uh, it was about the annual number of babies born in Uppsala during the last 50 years. Uppsala, was, as you know, is a university town, and that was the site of the academy at the time as well. Two years later, now we are in uh, 1746, the Royal Academy of Science decided that something had to be done to improve the system of compiling vital statistics in the country. It sent a memorandum written by, by its secretary, Per Elvius, to the secret committee. The secret committee was the most important standing committee of the parliament. This memorandum uh, did not adopt a hard sell approach to the problem. Instead of insisting how useful and profitable it would be for the government to have reliable data on the population, it merely reported results of a study uh, carried out using such data. In fact, the main result was an estimate of the population of the whole country and that of each uh, province separately. These figures must have been a major piece of news to the secret committee in the parliament. The reason was that, of course, that uh, the total was alarmingly small, only 2,097,000 people, whereas the only available estimates at the time put the figure near 3 million. So all of a sudden there was a loss, loss of almost 1 million people. These estimates uh, Elvius obtained by starting from the assumption that the population was stationary and then he assumed that the, the annual number of deaths in the kingdom was 70,000. And then he had data from uh, different uh, places in the country. He didn't have the whole picture but he did have data from various places and he constructed mortality, mortality tables using those da data, and then starting from that, divided the annual number of deaths uh, on age classes, and, and uh, then extrapolated, got the, the, the estimate for the whole country. Uh, in the memorandum, he also indicated that he would publish a paper uh, giving his estimation technique in the proceedings of the academy, but the paper never appeared. Uh, the reason for this is unclear, in particular, as no referees reports have survived. However, the method has been reconstructed later on and is available in, in literature as a reconstruction. Uh, let me... This is uh, 18th century Swedish, so I have to help you a little bit. Let me tell you that I wouldn't even dream of putting anything in Finnish up there, but that is uh, Swedish. And as you may, may see from there, the, the memorandum really did, does not suggest anything, but it points out that uh, even if a full census would no doubt produce even better figures, 
already these ones uh, obtained from the data available are useful as such to the, to the decision makers. And then there's, there's a cautious bait at the end saying that if the government decided to collect better data and uh, produce longer time series, then the academy would not sort of, uh, would really work hard to improve the estimates they've got now, now uh, after the new data uh, have become available. So that's all the academy said. Well, let's leave, go a little step back, a small step back and uh, leave uh, Pat Elvius uh, drafting his memorandum and let's uh, see what else was happening in Sweden and Finland at that time. And from our point of view, there was one important thing happening. And that was the, that uh, the Brigadier General Jakob Albrecht von Lantingshausen returned to his home country after an illustrious career in the French army. During those years, he had already be, also been a private tutor of two German princes and supervised their studies at the University of Leiden. So here you have the Swede uh, fighting for the French army, tutoring a couple of German princes through a Dutch university. So that was a true European. Anyway, he was obviously an important man, and when he returned to Sweden, he all at once assumed a seat in the parliament and became a member of a section of the secret committee. As a member, of course, he had to read a lot of documents, and among them, the reports uh, on the state of the provinces the governments were sending to the parliament. They landed in that section. The lack of rules in reporting the, the numbers greatly distressed the general accustomed to order and military position. This may have spurred him to give a deeper thought to the problem of obtaining reliable population data for decision makers. The result of his labor, then he, he sat down to write a memorandum as well, was a, was a memorandum in French. The original, uh, it's uh, told, has disappeared from the archives, but a Swedish translation exists so that we are able to discuss this interesting document here. And this is what I'm going to do next. After first noting a serious disorder in governors, governors, reporting, the, governors reporting, the memorandum pointing out that it was absolutely necessary for an administration to have accurate information on the size of the population. One had to know the strength of the country in three things, agriculture, trade, and defense. It was rather natural for the old pro to st stress the last sector, but any economist could have enthusiastically ag agreed with him on the first two ones. Von Lantingshausen did not just content himself to underline the advantages of population statistics in decision making. He also made a detailed proposal complete with drafts for tables on what kind of data were needed, and he also explained why. In suggesting that the statistics should include the number of marriages, he motivated his idea as follows. I'll put up another slide. This is quite remarkable. It's also 18th century Swedish, as, as before, once so some guidance is needed, I, I may, I, I'll provide it to you, what you see there is an argument that uh, the effects of nature deriving from physically from its causes can be modeled mathematically. And the modeling actually, the models will be so accurate that the modeling can, uh, can uh, take place without the model actually making a fool of himself. And what's even more important the models will be so accurate that one can omit the, uh, the error component from consideration without, without, without any problem. So indeed, there you have a very strong statement in, in favor of uh, a statistical modeling. And surely, a thing like that will warm an old econometrician's heart any time one sees it. Although the author liked to emphasize the practical usefulness on the, of the population data. He did not overlook their use for more abstract scientific purposes either. He was aware of birth statistics in London and Amsterdam, showing that the number of male births was higher than that of female births. And the memorandum also proposed research to find out what the situation was like in Sweden, Finland, and what the causes of this phenomenon might be. 
After discussing the need for statistics on births and deaths, von Lantinshausen noted the importance of accurate information on the causes of death. This he considered crucial to any administration caring about the welfare of their citizens. Let me all again excerpt this memorandum and uh, let's uh, take, a, take a look at What you now see are not yet the magic words of the modern welfare society, but they do come close. And uh, what von Lantingshausen is arguing there is that it's absolutely necessary to have reliable statistics on causes of death, because that's the only way for, for a government caring about the subjects to preclude uh, the effects of uh, harmful effects of poverty, hunger, contagious diseases, and so on. And then what you can read between the lines is, is considerable diplomatic talent there. Because uh, he points out up there that if we have these uh, statistics, they do give His Majesty an excellent opportunity to let his tenderness shine uh, upon his subjects. On the other hand, there's no mention about how much uh, such loving care would cost. In fact, it was only two centuries later than the subject themselves fully discovered how dreadfully expensive it could be to pursue the idea of letting the crown show extensive concern about their welfare. Nonetheless, I'm convinced that uh, Brigadier General von Lantingshausen would be very pleased to know that al although the people of today keep grumbling, they also keep paying. The memorandum ended with a strong plea to the king to organize the data collection uh, from the provinces in a practical and useful way so as to help his majesty to make his subjects happier. Those were the two memoranda. And now let's briefly look what, what happened then. Fortunately, those memoranda did not remain without response. In 1747, the Secret, Secret Committee sent a proposal to the king urging His Majesty to set up a system collecting demographic, demographic data. The proposal was very detailed. It included all the tables to be filled in by the clergy. It even specified which kind of paper was to be used for different tables, and who would print the tables and at which cost. The King agreed to the proposal, what else they have to do, obviously, and the rest, as they say, was history. Tabelwerket, that's uh, the name of the organization, was born and started functioning in the beginning of 1749. Not, of course, yet as a statistical office, but as a data collecting organization. The first report based on data collected by Tabel Tabelwerket was prepared in 1755. It disclosed, among other things, that the population of Sweden and Finland was 2,132,619 people. And uh, you can see that the uh, Elvius was not far off the mark. His estimate was 2,097,000. So it was actually, he came remarkably close. This figure was so low that it, together with other results, could not be published. The reason was that it would inevitably have revealed to the enemy how sparsely populated and thereby weak this 18th century declining, declining superpower actually was. Well. Uh, one must say to the, uh, to the defense of the, the authorities in Sweden, Finland, that Glasnost did arrive in Sweden, Finland uh, quite early, and actually didn't t take too late before those data were made public. However, that's already quite another story, and I'm not going to discuss it here. After I have now told you how we got the data, I think it's now your turn to tell what fantastic things you can do with the data collected in Finland, Sweden, and other places uh, since 1749. Uh, that will, I'm sure, to keep us all busy at least until Thursday noon. Thank you very much.